everyone, welcome. Thank you for being with us. My name is Danielle Lund. I use she, her pronouns, and I serve as Associate Director of Digital Engagement for the Alumni Association at Mount Holyoke. Um, as I mentioned before, if you feel comfortable doing so, feel free to drop your name, where you're zooming in from, and uh, your class year into the chat box. We'd love to see who's here celebrating reunion weekend. Um, in collaboration with the Mount Holyoke Dean of Faculty's office, we're so happy to offer three virtual back-to-class sessions during reunion this year and look forward to offering more opportunities like this throughout the next academic year. A few basic details before we jump into the class. Please note that this session is being recorded and that no other recording is permitted without prior written approval. As you're experiencing, we're in meeting format, so if you prefer not to be viewable or audible, please opt to keep your video and sound off throughout the presentation. Should you wish to adjust your view of the speakers, the control to do so is in the upper right-hand corner of your Zoom window. I will be sure to pin our speaker so that she is in the spotlight for the duration of the class. If you have questions throughout the session, please feel free to drop those in the chat box. Uh, I'll be monitoring throughout the, the class and we'll aim to address, address as many as possible at the close of the presentation. So now I'm so pleased to introduce our presenter. Uh, Cora Fernandez Anderson, Assistant Professor of Politics at Mount Holyoke, whose research explores social mobilization as a possible path towards social change. Her book, Fighting for Abortion Rights in Latin America, Social Justice Movements, State Allies and Institutions, focuses on abortion reform in Uruguay, Chile, and Argentina. Professor Fernandez Anderson, regularly teaches Introduction to Comparative Politics, Latin American Politics, Theories of Social Movements, Human Rights in Latin America, The Politics of Abortion in the Americas, and Sexual and Reproductive Rights in Latin America. She is also Mount Holyoke's advisor for the Five College Reproductive Health Rights and Justice Certificate Program. Professor Fernandez Anderson, Thank you for being with us today. I'm now gonna turn things over to you. Okay, thank you so much. Welcome everybody. Thank you for having me. So I'm also gonna share my screen. I have some slides uh, to go with my presentation today. And then I really welcome um, all your questions towards the end. So let's see if this works. Uh, there you go. Can you see the presentation? Looks great. Good? Yeah. Okay, great. So today I want to talk about the struggle for abortion rights in, in Latin America, because it has been a struggle, it's still a struggle. Um, here you can see an image of a demonstration in Argentina, that's the country where I'm from originally. And this is the green bandana that has become, you know, the symbol of the fight for abortion rights started in Argentina and then it migrated uh, to other countries. Um, so this is a little bit of what we will be talking about. So. Let me see, I can move on. So what I'm planning to do today is first give you a little bit of context, you know, just like what is the legal status of abortion in, in Latin America as a region, uh, show you a little bit of some of the consequences of these restrictions, and then, you know, have um, two parts of the presentation. First, try to give you some explanations of why it has been so restricted for so long and why in many countries it's still highly restricted, and then show you what are women's movements, what are abortion rights movements, uh, doing to challenge um, these restrictions. So hopefully I'll be able to fill, uh, fit everything in this time um, and I'll try to pace myself, but I can definitely also answer more questions if you have, you know, specific things that you want me to address. Uh, in particular, Argentina has recently legalized abortion in December 2020, so I definitely can answer lots of more detailed um, questions about this. So to start with, you know, what is the legal status of abortion um, in Latin America. Let me see. There it goes. So uh, we have some countries that are still, you know, four countries that are still under a total ban in which abortion is not allowed even if the life of that pregnant woman is at risk. And these are the years in which the bans have been passed. So just to show you also that some of these restrictions, you know, come from a long time ago, some, you know, criminal codes from the 19th century, but some of these more restrictive policies are not, you know, are, are more recent. 
Uh, so there has been kind of like a move towards criminalizing even more in some countries at the same time that some countries are moving in the opposite direction of legalization. So we have, you know, those two, you know, movements and counter movement in quite a bit of attention at this point. The, there are some countries that have some legal exceptions, only the threat to the life of the pregnant person. These are these three countries, but most of the countries, you know, are situated in this in between situation in which there's some combination of these legal exceptions, maybe threat to life, risk to the health, rape, um, incest, fetal malformations. Um, so that is like where most of the countries of the bulk of the countries are still in at, uh, in which, you know, even though there are some possibilities for pregnant people that don't want uh, to carry that pregnancy to have access. Uh, these are really hard, you know, exceptions to really get access to, you know, there's lots of um, obstacles legally to maybe you have to prove this was a rape or not, the issue becomes judicialized, it takes long, so it's not even as easy to have access to this uh, uh, to these uh, restricted uh, conditions. And here I also mentioned some of the, the years in which Colombia, you know, passed from a total ban in 06 to a legal exceptions. Uh, Chile only in 2017, you know, it used to be until that year in the total ban category. So just to show that things are changing also in the opposite direction. And then the only countries that are actually under a system in which legal abortion on demand during the first trimester is um, allowed. And actually I do want to add that in this, in all these cases, the abortion is provided by free in public hospitals. So that's, you know, like an added bonus of these recent reforms are Cuba since 1965, the first one, you know, in the region, Uruguay since 2012, Mexico, but only Mexico City since 2007, and the state of Oaxaca since 2019, because Mexico regulates abortion at the state level. So in all the other states um, of Mexico, they are under the, you know, category the um, above in terms of only allowing it under certain circumstances. And then Argentina, which is the new case that uh, very, very recently, December of 2020, in the middle of the pandemic, uh, just uh, legalized abortion under these uh, circumstances. So as you see, you know, it's mostly highly restricted with some change towards legalization in the last uh, 10 to 15 years. But also in the last 30 to 20 years, we have seen also movement towards uh, more restrictions, particularly in the Central American region. So most of the laws, you know, establish more or less three to six years imprisonment. Sometimes it's harder for women, sometimes it's harsher for abortion providers, but these laws are rarely enforced. But when they are enforced, they always fall on very vulnerable women, either poor women or women in rural areas. It's very unlikely that you will be reported if you're having, um, you know, an abortion like in a private clinic. Um, it's mostly, you know, those that have the, those women that go after having some health complications to the public hospital in which they are reported and then, you know, imprisoned. With the exception of El Salvador, though, which I don't know if you have heard um, in the news in which many women have been um, uh, facing in life imprisonment for even abortion and sometimes even miscarriages that are interpreted, you know, as um, an abortion. So that will be the case in which the judicialization and criminalization and punishment is, is more extreme. But in most of the, of the cases, um, it only targets the most uh, vulnerable women. Um, and as we will see, you know, despite all these restrictive laws, um, abortions happen on a daily basis. So a little bit of some data also to give you context. So despite all these restrictive laws, there are around like 6.5 million clandestine abortions that happen annually. So very clearly, as we have seen also in many other countries around the world, you know, the criminalization of abortion really doesn't work to prevent abortions from uh, happening. There are around 44 abortions per 1,000 women annually in the region. 60% of these abortions are unsafe. As a consequence, and safe abortion is responsible for 10% of maternal deaths, around 900 deaths annually in the region of what we consider completely preventable deaths, because we know that if abortion is practiced in a safe environment and if it's legalized, it's one of the most uh, of the safest medical procedures. Around, aside from the deaths, around close to 800,000 women are hospitalized for complications annually, which in, uh, you know, a public health system in many of these countries, which are quite poor, that is already, you know, facing a lot 
of um, uh, of, of a lot of um, problems to really uh, treat so many people. You know, these complications that are completely preventable are, you know, uh, using a lot of resources that could be used, you know, for some other um, uh, some other issues and some other illnesses in, in in countries that are really struggling to have enough funding for their public hospitals. Poor and rural women are usually overrepresented among the victims of unsafe abortion. As I said, it not only as the victims uh, of abortion in terms of death and complications, but also in terms of punishment for that uh, behavior. And the data comes from the Gutmeyer Institute 2018 uh, report. The data refers to 2010 to 2014. So in this context, you know, how can we explain uh, why um, abortion continues to be so restricted? You know, when we see that the criminalization is not working, that abortions continue to happen, that they're really ending like in deaths that can be preventable, that they can actually even be saving a lot of um, resources uh, within those public hospitals in, in economies that struggle. Uh, with uh, um, providing, you know, a strong public services. So why is this the case that we're still facing uh, quite restrictive laws? Um, so in my research, you know, that I do, uh, particularly in the southern home countries, as Danielle was mentioning, but overall I've seen um, in throughout Latin America and analyzing cases in Latin America, I find that, you know, the strength of the abortion rights movement and the counter movements and that balancing, you know, between like who is stronger is really what speaks to what happens in terms of policy. So when we find a really strongly organized abortion rights movement that is really pushing for legalization, they are the ones that manage to set the issue in the agenda, push for, you know, the passing of bills or in some cases, as it was the Colombian case through the Supreme Court. Uh, ruling and they really make a difference. But many times these movements are not as strong as those in the counter, uh, as the counter movements that are mostly, you know, like supported in Latin America by the Catholic Church, by evangelical churches that have become increasingly more powerful and present in many countries, particularly in Brazil and Central America. So it depends on these, you know, balancing act between the strength of each of those um, that we can see, you know, uh, uh, an, an extreme criminalization or um, a movement towards legalization as it has been the case in some countries more recently. But what does this strength depend on? Well, there are many factors, uh, both in the context and uh, international context and also the domestic politics context that might allow, you know, an abortion rights movement to rise more easily or that, that might, you know, keep that movement uh, weaker. So I want to just like introduce a little bit of some of the factors that I've been looking um, in my research. First thinking about international factors. So I think the global context and the timing has been like, you know, a disadvantage for Latin America. If we think about 1970s and 80s, when most of the legalization of, of abortion was happening in the US, in many European countries, that is the time in which, you know, it, uh, women were active in Latin America, but they had like really bigger fights to fight at the time. There were the time in which most countries were either under military dictatorships with no civil or political rights whatsoever. So women were active at fighting those dictatorships or there were the time, particularly in Central America, of strong civil wars. So there were main issues that were coming to the table and that will put abortion, you know, really not as a priority at that time. So there was no possibility that those movements, you know, that were happening in the northern countries could, you know, have an influence as we might see like now with other kind of movements in what is happening in this, uh, in, in, in these countries during uh, this period. However, because of many exiles of these uh, uh, dictatorships um, at the time, we're spending time in European countries, uh, in the US, they were coming in touch with a lot of the feminist ideas that were really strong in these countries, and then they will bring them back once they come back to um, once democracy comes back towards the late 1980s and um, the 1990s in Central America and uh, bring and put in touch, you know, uh, with the local women's organizations and bring this idea. So once democracy comes back, this is the time when women's organizations are coming together and including abortion as one of the demands that they want to bring, you know, and really saying, well, democracy is incomplete if we can't, you know, really have ownership and decision over our own 
body. We're like second class citizens. So we gain democracy, that is wonderful, but uh, this is not enough for us. So they were going to really plea, you know, and, and, and make this argument very strongly. However, by the time that these organizations are starting to come together and start pushing for the legalization of abortion, that counter movement that was headed at that time, you know, by the Catholic Church and the Vatican actually uh, had a lot of time to get ready because they knew this was coming. You know, they have experienced, as particular, you know, the legalization of abortion in many of the Catholic countries in Europe. They lost there and they were putting all their bets in saving, you know, the issue of abortion in Latin America, the largest region in the largest Catholic region, you know, in the world. So the Vatican, particularly um, under John Paul II that came to power, you know, in the beginning of the 1980s, uh, will really start putting an effort and like prioritizing what they will call like moral issues in terms of the family values and, you know, protection of the of the child from the moment of conception in Latin America. So when the women's organizations start to get moving, they already have, you know, to face like a counter, you know, movement that is quite organized and with the Catholic Church um, uh, behind. So they're really going to be like a really uh, a hard moment to really push uh, for this, uh, for this uh, struggle and this demand at this point. It will take longer. It will take more time. And that's why we're seeing like in the last 10 years, you know, the, the consequences of that struggle, those struggles that started with democratic transitions are finally start to give some fruit in some of the legalizations that we saw, you know, in some of Mexico states, in Uruguay and in Argentina. But what about, you know, the domestic context? So in terms of domestic factors, I want to zoom into some social and cultural issues, but also, you know, some political factors. Um, if we're thinking about social and cultural issues, definitely, you know, usually the, the, the immediate answer, usually when I teach this, this uh, topic to, to my students, it's like, well, why is abortion restricted? Because of the Catholic Church. It's kind of like an immediate. And of course, that's like a key factor that I don't want to, you know, diminish its importance. Definitely the church had had like a key historical role completely, you know, um, uh, immersed in political issues. There was a lack, and still in some countries, a lack of separation between church and state. It has permeated, you know, the culture of the whole region. It has permeated the educational system because the church is in charge of um, a large part of the educational system at all levels in this country. So of course, they're like a strong force that are pushing, you know, these ideas. But it's true that they were so successful that actually, you know, those ideas have gone beyond those that actually define themselves as Catholic. If you check, you know, numbers of public opinion or this global barometers that check values, you know, actually the number of people I self-identified as Catholics is diminishing with every decade. But still the anti-choice and, you know, the condemnation of abortion is still quite strong. So they have managed to really influence the culture in a way um, that these values went beyond those that associate themselves or identify themselves uh, with Catholicism or, or with a, being a religious person. And that is directed with that strong stigma that the practice of abortion had, which is tied with this idea of the ideal of womanhood. You know, in America is having like a very strong maternalistic um, uh, culture and one in which uh, you know we are raised with the idea that the main fulfill fulfillment of a woman is to be a mother and that equation between womanhood and motherhood and motherhood as the essence of womanhood is quite strong in how we are raised um, in this region of course with some variance within the, the countries and also with the caveat that it's starting to change you know the newer generations when you talk to Latin American teenagers they're really challenging these ideas and then many Many, you know, young women are starting to really, uh, you know, rebel against this mandate that they have to become mothers. But it has been really imprinted in all the previous generations, like my generation, quite strongly. So I think, you know, through these, that idea of abortion being a horrible sin has been, gone beyond, you know, the Catholic value or whatever the Catholic Church says, and it has really permeated the general culture of the region. And that is why it has been like really so hard to present it in a different light and, and, and push uh, or uh, an understanding of abortion as a positive and empowering uh, moment in the life of a woman, which is what feminists have been doing, you know, since again, the 1980s, 90s, and have finally have some success in some of these countries. 
but it has been you know really hard because of how deep you know that um, those values uh, remain in most of the in most of the countries and this pair done with this idea of double discourse and this is um i owe that um analysis to bonnie shepherd um, um an academic that has been researching this uh, this issue as well and it's interesting because she claims you know how strong um you know how, how hard it has been to legalize abortion and put push people you know together to claim for this to demand for this legal change to happen because of this existence of double discourse so the fact that um the criminalization of abortion allows you to have like a particular position in public and says yes of course i condemn abortion this is a horrific thing uh for someone that is pregnant to do but at the same time when you need it if you are actually uh, going through an unwanted pregnancy or if your daughter does or if your wife does you're able if you have certain amount of money to have uh, an illegal abortion and you know um, uh, have you know that pregnancy interrupted uh, so that escape valve you know so it doesn't mean that because the criminal code says that abortion is illegal, that it's not accessible at all. No, actually, if you have a certain amount of money, you can have a very safe abortion. It will still be illegal. It will still be surrounded by, you know, uncertainty uh, because of, of doing something that is illegal, but you would not die from it and you would do, not have, you know, like um, in general health complications. So that option that is available, that is Cape Bob, has allowed, you know, for these restrictions to continue uh, because when most people um, had a need of an abortion, they had been able to access it in some level, at least, you know, those that are wealthy enough to pay for a, a medically safe uh, service. So that has uh, made, uh, has, has made this issue quite unique because many people, when they try to understand, you know, many of the legal reforms in Latin America, and we usually, we uh, or many scholars point to the issue of religion and the issue um, of the Catholic Church. The question is like, well, but why was, you know, divorce legalized? Uh, why was same-sex marriage legalized in, in many of these countries, but not abortion? And I think it has to be tied to this idea that, well, if there's no legal divorce, nobody can access it. If there's no legal same-sex marriage, nobody can access it. But if there's no legal abortion, a lot of people can still access it. So there is that escape path that allowed this criminalization to continue for much longer um, than with the other issues. And that's why I wanted to bring this issue. And the final issue in terms of social cultural perspectives and, and factors that I want to raise is the issue of the battle for the human rights frame. So just to give a little bit of context, you know, because of the story of military dictatorships and civil wars, the human rights movements in this region had like a, are very strong and had a, a strong legitimacy. You know, they have really fought for the transition to democracy. They have fought for accountability for human rights, for the horrendous human rights that had happened during the 1970s and 80s in many of these countries. So um, any cause that can be associated with those human rights movements and defined as a human rights, you know, immediately, you know, has resonates with these societies, you know, like has like an, an immediate legitimacy that is added to. And that happened, you know, for example, with the issue of same-sex marriage, of how that was organized in many of these countries and defined as, well, we want the same rights that um, heterosexuals have, you know, and, and we, we want, you know, equal rights and thinking about human rights, which was like a very successful campaign that led to many reforms in many countries. In the issue of abortion, there's really a battle for that human rights frame. Like both sides really claim that notion of human rights and that they are on the side of human rights. And they haven't been as successful in, you know, negating the fact that the other side is also fighting for a human right. And I want to go a little bit ahead and show you this um, picture that I can translate for you and showing how this frame is really battled over. So the first picture that we say that we see is it says, and I translate, unsafe abortion never again. So this is a picture of a demonstration in Argentina. Never again is a very strong word immediately for anybody in Argentina and in many Latin American countries associated with the human rights movement, because that was the main frame that was used to never again to you know, human rights abuses committed you know, by the military dictatorship. And actually, even in this font and this side, it is how you know, um, it is placed in, uh, in the cover of the book that 
the state uh, wrote um, with a, a commission on the disappearance that reported all the crimes that had been committed. So it's immediately, you know, I see it and immediately I connected it with the fight for human rights. On the other side, we see a picture that was a billboard in Chile in which um, there's a picture of a soccer stadium where you know, many of the human rights abuses were committed under um, Augusto Pinochet. And the, the frame is abortion is torture, death and disappearance. So they are the other side that opposed legalization of abortion actually is equating abortion to all the human rights abuses committed by the dictatorship. So this is just an example of how you know, um, movements in favor and against abortion really are claiming and appropriating you know, this idea of human rights and the struggle that each of these countries went through to fight for human rights and want to you know, associate with their own side and define it you know, as an issue that they are connected with. So I think that has been also hard because none of them has been able to finally win the struggle. They, they have been back and forth. And I want to go back to the previous. Uh, let me see. There you go. <laughs> so the other issue, let me see how I'm with time. Yes, I have still enough time. Aside from social and cultural factors that I wanted to talk about was this issue was a political issue. So because of how abortion is in general associated with a negative practice, a sin, a horrific deed by a woman, um, in a way, you know, politicians uh, have tried to shy away from the issue. You know, they really perceived it for a long time as a politically cost issue. It's going to cost me an election. I just better not even talk about it, you know, I ignore it. And that's why in particular in the case of Argentina, it has been, you know, for so long, there have been like for 15 years bills in Congress pushing for legalization of abortion that has never been even introduced in the agenda. So it's not that they failed. It's like, no, nobody has ever discussed it for so many years until 2018. Uh, that the, the first bill like made it to, to the, the floor of the Congress. So uh, my research have showed me that for most part within politicians, there's like a small group that are, you know, really anti-choice in principle. They define themselves as pro-lifers, like they really think and believe that there's a life and a person from the moment of conception, so they vote accordingly. Then there's on the other side, a small, a small group of politicians that are define themselves as feminists and they are really in favor of legalization. But most of the politicians are in that center and really sensing what is going on with this issue. You know, am I gonna side with one or the other? So for a long time, when there was this strong stigma in most of these societies and this negative association for abortion, most of them just sided with the anti-choice perspective and they prefer to you know you know not not push for any any change at all but in some of these countries case uruguay case argentina some states in mexico we can start to see that shift of the social cultural uh, 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 factors and dimension and see you know how stigma is diminishing because of the work of feminism how feminist movements you know are really getting uh, stronger and really uh, challenging, you know, some of the uh, mandates of, of, of motherhood that are present in their culture. So politicians are starting to be a little bit more open once movements are showing that they can, you know, bring like thousands, hundreds of thousands of people in the streets, uh, that that might, you know, equate some votes. So we're seeing, you know, a shift, not in all the countries, but in some of the countries and um, of this perception of political cost that was very, very clear um, some years ago. So how are these, you know, feminist movements here really challenging, you know, this social cultural dimension and factors? And this is those the. So in general, we're seeing, you know, three strategies uh, present. So the obvious one is, you know, pushing for a legal reform, pushing for legalization. They're drafting many times themselves like bills and getting support from representatives in Congress to introduce them um, in Congress. Uh, with the case of Colombia is the only one that had had, you know, like rulings go through the Supreme Court, but most countries, you know, have been pushing for it through Congress, through a, through a passing of a, a bill in Congress. So that's, you know, one of the main things that is happening. We see them, you know, uh, lobbying and organizing, you know, joint work with certain sympathetic legislators um, in power with particular parties that are starting to, you know, introduce, you know, these issues to their, to their platforms. Uh, we see them in large demonstrations as the image that I showed at the beginning um, in the streets and mobilizing a lot of young, young people, you know, like that, the generation of teenagers and high schoolers have been really, really strong in these demonstrations. And they have made of feminism almost an identity, you know, 
So that's like quite interesting. They define themselves as feminists. So it's not only about abortion, it's how they see their whole life. Like the whole worldview, you know, has changed from previous generations of how they perceive themselves and see themselves, um, uh, you know, in being active in this co feminist collectives, feminist movement, and really part, like a central part of their life and who they are. So that is quite important and I think promising in terms of advising rights because the newer generations are, uh, have really different values than you know, my generation in their 40s. The other strategy that has been very interesting and have been used in many countries um, is using the health clause. What does, uh, does that mean? Many of these countries, as I said, had a health clause in which you know, abortions are legal when there's a risk to the health of the pregnant woman. So what they have been doing is reinterpret that health clause in a much broader way. They really started picking up of the World Health Organization definition of health in a comprehensive way. So this health, it's not just physical health, but refers to psychological health, social, so, uh, social health. So really much broader. And many doctors have followed and have started to provide abortions with this particular definition of health. So really saying any unwanted pregnancy is a psychological threat to your current health. So if there's a health clause in the legislation, I can interpret that if you don't want this pregnancy, you know, this abortion is legal. And I've seen it, you know, I've sat in some consultations in Argentina when I was doing field research and how empowering that was for these women that were going, you know, to request an abortion because they were not saying, I'm going to, this is illegal, but I'm, you know, I'm going to do it anyway because I want to help you. They would say, no, what you're doing is legal. You know, this, the law says that if your health is at risk, you can have an abortion. And actually your psychological health is a deep risk of being forced to carry a pregnancy for nine months, which many have equal uh, to torture. Um, so it, it really started changing, you know, like that, like how can we use those legal instruments that we have at this time to really make abortion more accessible until, you know, our legislators decide that, that they can actually change the law and give us, you know, um, abortion on demand. Um, uh, during the first 14 weeks, as it's been the case of the last reforms. And the final strategy that they have been working on is a direct action. Um, a lot of uh, people in the movement really got tired of trying to change the law. They said, you know, politicians are not listening to us. We've been demanding this. We are in the streets. We're showing our strengths. They're not paying attention to us. They're completely ignoring. But women are dying now. You know, I can't wait until the next, you know, legislative session. I... I really need to address this issue. So they started with the help, you know, of the development of misoprostol, the, you know, abortion pill in which you can have like a, a self-abortion that is very healthy and, and, and safe in your house. Um, they started initially developing hotlines um, in which they will provide the right information as uh, described by the um, World Health Organization on the phone on how to take the amount of pills uh, for how much time, how to do it, and um, just it spread you know, this uh, information um, around through these hotlines. But after that, a lot of movement says, well, a hotline, you know, it's too impersonal. It's not enough. You know, we want to be with these women. We want to spread what they started to define as feminist abortion, you know, an abortion that is fully supported, that is empowering, you know, that gives you, you know, the reins of your own life. And they started to uh, de uh, de um, design a service of abortion doulas that will actually meet with you, talk about, you know, your particular circumstances, help you um, uh, deal and know, give you the right information of how to do that self-abortion and be with you at that moment if you didn't have anybody else to go through. Uh, that moment. In Argentina, the group is called Socorristas, kind of rescue workers will be the translation, and that they have spread, you know, throughout the region. They have trained, traveled and trained, you know, groups of, of women in other Latin American countries to provide um, these services. And, you know, they did this even though abortion has been legal, illegal until very recently in Argentina, and it's still illegal in many countries. So really challenging um, you know, the illegality of that practice and being very public about it, you know, giving press conferences about how many women they have served this year, you know, like what, um, um, taking, you know, uh, uh, the data of like what kind of women were searching for abortions and in a way feeling that they were preparing the route to when abortion will be legal. You know, I'm providing all this data that later to the state once abortion will be legal because we are the only ones that, you know, are really taking count and understanding what is going on in the world of clandestine abortions, because since they're clandestine, nobody knows how many they are, 
who uh, you know does an abortion you know where are they happening you know if women already have children or not are they single so it, it's been like a really interesting process of what these um, groups these feminist collectives have, have been doing uh to serve you know um uh, women with unwanted pregnancies uh until you know in the case of argentina until the, the abortion was legalized in 2020 but still they're doing it in many of these countries in which um, abortion is still illegal so I will stop here to allow for some questions. And I think I was more or less a little bit under 40 minutes. Um, so um, I had one last slide, I think, in which I show you some of the direct action. Um, uh, yeah, so it's always nice to see pictures. So this, for example, is um, a statue of, um, of a virgin in, in Ecuador. And they hang you know, the, uh, a sign with the phone number of the hotline right there because they knew it was going to be a publicity stunt you know that the media covered it so it was a very easy way and cheap way of getting free publicity and for every person in the country to know uh the phone number if they needed an abortion but of course you know immediately after that was put up you know the police came and took it down um the other picture is also a demonstration of chilean women this is like in front of the casa de la moneda that is like the presidential palace in chile also publicizing their uh, hotline and then what they did also in ecuador is like had these stamps ecuador has a dollarized economy they use the the u.s dollar as their currency so they stamped you know the number in and bills, um, so same thing, you know, to make it accessible. They had stickers that put in public bathrooms, you know, so how do we spread this number for anybody that really needs um, an abortion to get um, access to it? So I'm gonna stop there and, and listen to some questions. I'm also gonna stop sharing so I can see more of you. Thanks so much, Professor Fernandez Anderson. And I am just going to also um, add a spotlight for my asking of questions too. Um, so just peeking at the chat here, I've seen a couple comes, co questions come through about um, culturally parenting um, and uh, so a question on family size and um, sort of comparative perspective to the US uh, in terms of how many children are women having um, in the countries that you've studied? Yes, um, I don't have unfortunately specific data now with me and I'm very bad remembering numbers. Um, so I can tell you uh, specifics, but yes, definitely uh, families are larger still than, than here in the US, but there is still like a tendency towards like smaller families, also driven, you know, by economic crisis um, that has been hitting, you know, and uh, I would say now with the pandemic even more, um, most of the countries. Um, so maybe not necessarily, um, you know, driven by desire many times, but also with how expensive it is to raise uh, more than more than one or two, two children. But still, you know, having three children definitely in, in Argentina is still quite common. Um, so um, it feels like they are like bigger than, bigger size than, um, than in the US. And a follow-up to that, um, do you observe that there are more Latin, uh, Latin American women who choose to be single mothers um, as more women in the U.S. have chosen to be? Yes, definitely, you know, with the diminished uh, stigma around the single mother, yeah, it's happening uh, more, more and more, I would say, like in the last two decades for sure. Uh, but I don't have specific numbers to compare, unfortunately, with me um, here. But yes, it is. Um, and I think, you know, particularly among, you know, those against abortion, they usually use those single mothers that decided to raise their children as an example of how heroic they are and how they really embraced, you know, their pregnancy and their maternity despite really harsh circumstances. So those are examples that they will usually be, um, you know, shown as it, it's possible and we're here to help you and you don't have to you know make the decision to to have an abortion thank you um questions here about um sex education and birth control like yes. can you expand uh on you know sort of what 
um, uh, yes, I would say, and again, it's hard to generalize in the whole region, but I would say in general, um, if I can generalize, around the 1990s, most countries passed some kind of um, reproductive health law program, you know, they and started to work um, providing, uh, in some cases, also free contraception. Um, you know, these are countries still that struggle with uh, economically, but many times their public health care systems are much more generous than what we have here in the U.S. Um, in terms of, of programs and, and availability of services. The problem is that one thing is to have a law and a program, and then the other thing is that these contraceptions are accessible, that they are continuous, you know. And um, the problem particularly is with gatekeepers, local gatekeepers. So there might be, you know, a national government that is very much in favor of reproductive rights. They have like put some money in the health ministry uh, to buy contraception, distribute it to all the provinces and, you know, like um, small cities. But then, you know, there's a governor that is anti-choice and they just like leave all the contraception in storage and they never get distributed in the public hospitals, for example. So maybe you were using that, but then, you know, suddenly one year you can't have access. So, so we know how important this continuation in in, in birth control, so then you suddenly don't have access to it a lot. So it's really hard to enforce, that's what my point mm -hmm. is. So there might be very, you know, well-designed laws that have been passed in the National Congress, but then, you know, the enforcement that those, you know, resources reach every single part of the country. And, and again, it's very easy, maybe if you are in the main capital cities or in the main cities around the country, there's more availability of resources. They tend to have, you know, more liberal um, elected officials, more hospitals that you can reach out. But it always, you know, comes down to like the more remote areas, rural areas, more conservative areas that are the ones like lagging behind. And with sex education, it's a similar situation. There have been laws also that have passed that sex education has to be required in every single level, you know, of, uh, you know, starting, you know, with very, you know, um, of course, like depending on the age of, of, of the child, but starting in, you know, kindergarten through primary school, through high school. But a lot has been fought around like, okay, what are the contents? You know, what is being taught? And are private schools allowed to have, you know, their own um, sexual education with their own values and attuned to their own values or not? So there have been a lot of back and forth. In particular, not so much, I would say, with the issue of... Um, Reproductive rights, the main issue that is at the key in many countries in Latin America at this point is uh, what they, what, what those that oppose, you know, re um, reproductive rights call the gender ideology and the idea that, you know, gender and sex are different and um, that we can choose our own gender. So that has been really vilified as, you know, indoctrinating young children that they can actually decide mm -hmm. if they are a male or a female. Um, and that has been a very successful campaign that, the, that those, you know, against uh, gender identity. Some of these countries have passed gender identity laws in which it is possible to change your ID and name um, uh, based on your preference, you know, without uh, having any, you know, psychological tests done to you or, you know, old requirements that were in existence or without the need of any surgery to make you look as that particular gender should look. So there have been quite progressive gender identity laws, but that has generated a backlash when this content has been, you know, um, required or made it, you know, uh, in, in the bills to be included in, um, in, 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 in schools and sexual education within schools that generated this movement that is called con, tus, con mis hijos no te metas, don't mess up with my children. It started in Peru. It was a very, very, very strong frame and very strong slogan, slogan that really resonated with people, you know, don't mess up with my children, don't interfere with my children, con, con mis hijos no te metas. And it started in Peru and that, you know, generated, you know, you can see it in almost every Latin American country, the same campaign, the same slogan, and it's mostly fighting content of what they call gender ideology, what we might call, you know, a gender perspective, you know, a gender lens um, that is introduced in some of the contexts of sexual education. And they have been quite successful, you know, that has become pretty, you know, mainstream for people to oppose. It's like, well, the children are too young, you can't, you know, tell them, that they can choose, they're either you know, a boy or a girl, why are you introducing all these um, strange ideas? So I think that has generated even more um, conflict if with the issue of sexual education, that some of the issues of, of reproductive rights. Interesting, thank you for expanding there. 
um, a question here. What about um, thinking about at the present, like consequences for the father in terms of, um, or the a man in terms of um, what's going on with uh, the abortion movement? Um, I don't know exactly what they refer to um, with consequences for the father. There have been, um, uh, maybe two things come to my mind. Um, definitely all the legalization, the, the, the laws that legalize abortion don't allow, you know, the supposed father of that child to interfere with the decision. And there has been one case actually that went to the courts already in Argentina. The legalization of abortion is from December, actually December 29th of 2020. <laughs> and already there was a case of a father um, that, uh, you know, that wanted to uh, challenge the decision of actually it was an ex-partner. So an ex-partner challenging the decision of the ex-partner to have an abortion. And it was dismissed because, you know, the decision is um, of the pregnant person mm -hmm. and nobody else can interfere. But another discussion that has been a lot happening in these feminist movements is that what is the role of men? You know, initially there was a lot of, um, you know, in these large demonstrations that were happening, you know, before, and I'm thinking in particular in Argentina here, before legalization happened now this December, um, a lot of men were saying, well, I'm also feminist, I want to participate. And um, a lot of women were saying, well, not this, you know, this is our movement. If you want to participate, stay home and take care of the kids, you know, like just like do supportive roles, you know, this is our moment, this is our time. So most of the demonstrations was like mostly um, women, um, uh, really kind of being at the forefront of the organization and um, of the of the large uh, demands. But there has been also a little bit of, you know, yeah, conflict with like, what, what does a feminist man do? <laughs> you know, if they want to be supportive and a lot of divisions within the movement. Some people say, no, they should come. Some people say, no, you know, like we need, you know, help in other issues. Um, so the, um, I think there's still, you know, a, a a lot of discussion around like what will be the, the role that um, that men can take in this really strong feminist movement that is taking over many of the Latin American countries. I don't know also if you have read recently about Chile, they are about to write um, a new constitution. They still are ruled by the 1980 constitution written by Augusto Pinochet, the dictator, and they're ready now to, you know, give themselves a new constitution and um, lots of feminists have been you know uh, elected recently this past weekend uh, to the to the constitutional convention uh, so there's a lot of you know there's a really strong definitely in the southern cone um, of Latin America a very strong feminist movement that is you know going beyond issues of abortion you know that how they want to restructure the whole society um, and uh, challenging, you know, the gender roles and, and, and challenging, you know, particularly the issue of, you know, um, women's uh, having the heavy load of caring for others and how can we restructure society for gender equality to be a reality. So uh, that's something that I really want to watch closely to see what, what will that constitution, will those feminists really be successful in introducing, you know, like strong norms into that new constitution that Chile is giving itself um, or you know what, what will be those debates that's definitely something to watch but that Chile is a, a country that is still not having legal abortion on demand uh, but the feminist movement is quite strong they currently have a bill in congress to push for this for a similar bill that was passed in Argentina recently uh, but you know now they're really busy with a constitutional convention we'll see what happens um, but it, it's it's a country to watch like many parties on the left have defined themselves as feminist recently in the past two years they have really you know embraced within all other principles you know social justice it's like no yes we also define ourselves as feminists which is something that i find you know quite peculiar because i haven't seen in other countries yet so it's definitely one in which feminism has been really at the forefront of uh, the large mobilizations that we've been seeing since 2019 the push for a change in the constitution um so it's 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 quite um, an interesting phenomenon to you know beyond the issue of abortion Thanks, Cora. Um, an interesting question here. Um, as an abortion provider in the U.S., one benefit of the pandemic is hugely improved access to medication of abortion for our patients, telehealth, and the ability to have medications mailed to them. Is there any chance this could be a way to give more access to patients in Latin America? Is there an underground medical abortion scene? Yes, that's what happening and what I was mentioning, you know, that direct action, you know, strategy of um, part of the abortion rights movement, um, those abortion doulas also, you know, help 
people, um, you know, get get access to the medication, which, um, you know, misoprostol is legal in most of these countries because it's not a, it was not produced initially as an abortion medication, you know, it's for ulcers and other other medical uses. So they, they can still get it. It's of course, it just needs, uh, you know, um, um, medical authorization. So, you know, it's, it's hard sometimes to get it, but it's available. Mifepristin, that is the other, you know, drug that is usually given where abortion is legal. It's, it's not available at all. So the, the success of the medical abortion is a little bit lower than if you take both drugs because mifepristin doesn't exist um, um, in this uh, countries that in which abortion uh, is not legal. But yes, there is an underground. But at the same time, because it's underground, you know, there's always risk to, am I getting the right medication? Is this like really safe? Or is just like somebody taking advantage of me in the internet trying to sell me, you know, some kind of, um, of, of pill? for this. Um, there's uh, sometimes, you know, there's little tips that people, you know, use, for example, well, go, you know, and ask a doctor for a prescription, but, you know, prescribe mesoprostol under your, you know, a male, you know, friend or a partner, you know, mm -hmm. so they are actually prescribing it for, uh, you know, maybe an ulcer or whatever, you know, like other uses the drug has. So it's less suspicious in the pharmacy that if it's a woman that goes, so there's like lots of, you know, tips that people have of how to do. And also, you know, doctors can't also be seen to prescribe constantly. You can't go to the same one because they can be challenged, you know, that their, their license, are they really prescribing this for the right reasons or for different purposes? Um, so, you know, doctors also want, need to be careful with uh, how, you know, even if they might be supportive, how much they do um uh, of these issues so yes it's been there's also the um a more international organization women on web um started by this dutch doctor rebecca gumpers she used to have this women on waves and there's a really nice documentary about like her her project um which she would go in europe to the countries where abortion was still illegal on a boat on a dutch boat and provide abortions in the boat because the laws in, in, in the sea are the laws of the, you know, where the ship belongs to and in, in the Netherlands abortion was um, allowed and it created lots of controversy in many countries uh, where they went in Portugal and Spain before, you know, the, the abortion was legal uh, in Poland in Ireland. Um, but then after, you know, this initiative, she started with women on web. So actually women anywhere in the world can write to this service and ask for to be mailed, you know, the, the misoprostol and they do. So they, they sometimes they even send it with drones if they're like a closer country. Um, sometimes they send it um, in the mail for, for people all, all around the world. So there is that service and then, you know, some local ones. But yeah, it's still hard to get access to the medication. So all the information is there and the hotlines and the abortion doulas provide support. But getting hold of the medication is like the, the hard part and making sure that you're, you know, getting the right one and, and safe one. Um, so, so that's, that's what is being done and it's a lot, um, but, uh, definitely, you know, the legalization gives access more broadly, uh, to everybody. Thanks so much, Cora. Um, for those who might not be familiar with the term, term, can you ex expound on Southern Core, like what Southern Core entails? Oh, Southern Cone, I'm sorry, that's, that's like the the bottom countries of Latin America. So it includes Argentina, Chile, and Uruguay. So that's like kind of a sub-region within Latin America. Some people include Brazil sometimes, uh, but usually it's like the tip, you know, those three southernmost uh, countries, southern cone, sorry if, if Thank you. it was not clear. Um, and there was a question, did, are there organizations akin to, or, or something like Planned Parenthood in, in any of the, the countries that you've researched? Yeah, there's yeah, there's lots of organizations. There's um, there's definitely international Planned Parenthood fund that also helps you know funds a lot of these local organizations. Um, so it's always you know useful to you know there's there's very it's very hard to get funding locally for these uh, for these kind of projects. So a lot of times you know funds come uh, internationally. Uh, another strong group is the Catholics for the Right to Choose also, you know, started in the U.S., but then has branches in, in most of the Latin American countries. And they have been really strong, especially challenging the church and saying, you know, we can be Catholic and be in favor of abortion, which is something that not everybody knows in Latin America. But the, you know, condemnation of abortion in the Catholic church came only in the late 19th century. So initially, you know, uh, the church supported the theory of Aristotle that like the soul came to the body, you know, 
40 or 80 days after conception. And that's what they supported, but only, you know, as more scientific evidence came and tied to some, you know, religious issues towards the late 19th century is when they start, you know, being uh, more rigid towards the issue of abortion. And it's not until 1930 that they condemn abortion in a, in a document under all circumstances, like even therapeutic abortion or even when the life of that uh, woman is at risk. So. It, they seem to portray it as something that, you know, it's in the Bible or something that is unchangeable, but it's actually not. So that's like a little bit of what these Catholics for choice are, are trying to raise. You know, you can still, you don't need to renounce your faith, but you can still be part of the Catholic church or, you know, feel yourself Catholic and also, you know, support abortion. Of course, the church doesn't recognize Catholics for choice as a Catholic organization. You know, they, they still feel that that's, that goes against. And the other thing is that, Abortion being a sin is not a dogma, you know, and dogma being, you know, that core beliefs that you have to believe to be part of the Catholic Church. So, um, again, so that's what they are claiming. Um, so, so that it has been an organization, particularly in Argentina, they have been really, really at the core of the campaign to legalize abortion Catholics for the right to choose. Um, they have been very, very active. Um, the director, Mar Marta Alanis, that I interviewed a couple of times, you know, has been very good in lobbying Congress and creating uh, this uh, multi-party coalition that was created in Argentina, you know, like there was not the support of only one party. They managed to get support from all the parties, all the political parties part of it, of course. So every single political party was divided, whether they were in favor or against abortion in Argentina, but they managed to get enough votes um, in, 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 in all the parties. And, and this organization was key in building that alliance, you know, that coalition across the parties. So uh, very, very strategic. They knew what they were doing. They knew very well how Congress worked and they managed to get enough votes for finally approve it. So that's another uh, big one. And then there's just local organizations. Usually the campaigns to legalize abortion are formed by hundreds of small organizations, some more international, some more local. Some are just very small feminist collectives, you know, that are just like at the neighborhood, you know, uh, level. Um, and they usually come together and have all these forums and discussions and, 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 um, and share um, their views and they're present in demonstrations in, in, in all kinds of um, activities um, that they do both, you know, in the main capital city, but even, you know, at, at different places throughout the, throughout the country. So in many of these countries, again, like in Chile, in Argentina and Uruguay, they managed to be, you know, kind of present even in like more remote areas or more conservative areas that it hasn't been the case in the past. So really raising awareness throughout and they've become what we said, kind of like really federal movements that they're not only about the main city, you know, and the capital city, but they really have uh, activists all throughout. Thank you. Um, we just have a couple of minutes left here, yeah. um, and I see, I think this is, a, you know, maybe a good closing question. Uh, do you know if the, the topic, the politics of reproduction um, in other areas of the world is, ex like, is taught at Mount Holyoke or mm. explored at Mount Holyoke? Um, if you have other colleagues who... You know, yeah, who work on other areas. I'm trying, well, in general, there's like a strong group of faculty in the five colleges, not just at Mount Holyoke, that, that do work on, you know, what we call reproductive justice, uh, reproductive rights. I don't know if there's any specific, you know, people that looked into, you know, uh, other areas of the world. There's a lot of people doing work within the U.S. Um, you know, I can think of, you know, Laura Briggs in UMass, um, Marlene Freed at Hampshire College, uh, well, like recently retired from Mount Holyoke, Lynn Morgan in anthropology. She also focused in Latin America. We had like a big of an overlap. She was mostly focusing in Central America, a lot in Costa Rica, mm -hmm. but um, so, so she's someone also. Um, I'm, I'm just trying to think of other areas, particularly focused in reproduction. Um, I remember there were classes also taught at Hampshire um, on, for example, the one child policy from China, you know, so there were people teaching uh, reproductive uh, rights um, in China for sure. But I don't know if, yeah, so specific um, to different regions, um, other regions aside from the US. And usually what I teach is either Latin America or I do these classes on the Americas in which we compare the US with Latin America. 
uh, which also I usually highlight to my students, you know, there's especially with the challenge that, you know, Roe v. Wade is having at this point in the US, there's so much also to learn from what, what these movements are doing in, in Latin America to also bring back um, to um, the US, particularly all these direct actions. Well, there's definitely also in the US, these, you know, underground um, networks also exist in terms of hotlines and providing, you know, access to medical abortion. Um, and uh, yeah, in which in many states, it's still, you know, not, not allowed. Now with the pandemic, things have changed a little bit, but uh, before and, and in which, you know, many states access is quite uh, just now. Great. Professor Fernandez Anderson, thank you so much for being with us, for sharing um, all of your research and um, expertise over the course of this session. Uh, we are just about at close here. Um, and I will, uh, you know, take a look at the, the, the chat, make sure we have that, that saved. Um, but I want to drop in the chat box a link to um, the reunion landing page um, where you can, you know, go visit the, the calendar and see what events are coming up next. We have another back to class tomorrow morning. Of course, it's the annual meeting tomorrow. And I know that so many classes have um, their own class specific events going on throughout the weekend. Um, so we're excited for events yet to come. But again, uh, Professor Fernandez Anderson, thank you so much for, for being with us in this moment. And thanks to all who are present for the, the session. Um, we really appreciate it. Can I say one more, one more thing? Because in one of my classes, we've been talking with students, you know, we found a lot of the archive in the archives of Mount Holyoke information about, you know, reproductive rights at Mount Holyoke. And we're thinking for one of my classes doing a project of researching that. And I would love, you know, students to contact alums to, you know, talk a little bit about their experience in terms of, yeah, access to birth control, what was, you know, discussed about abortion, you know, in other decades. So I was wondering if, if people would be interested of being part of that project. I think, you know, students would benefit a lot and it would be interesting to, you know, to both learn how to work in the archives, but also to conduct some interviews. So if there are alums on this call who would be interested in, in sharing with students in that way, please say so in the chat. And uh, like well, I said- Let me know, yes, if I have some names, <laughs> if I have some names that would be great to know, you know, where to start. Awesome. Well, thanks everybody again. Great being with you all today. Uh, and we look forward to seeing everyone at um, additional reunion events. So that's where we'll, we'll close out right now. Bye everyone. Have a Thank great you. day.